no other religious group is lied about like the Catholic Church. And anyone who's dealt with Protestants knows that they believe some pretty ridiculous things about Catholics as a result. This can be frustrating since Catholics end up defending the church against the same accusations over and over again. In this video, I will go over a few of the most ridiculous things that Protestants believe about Catholics and give a brief refutation. The purpose is not to give a complete apologetic of each subject. I have videos on my channel giving a more in-depth defense of these topics. See those videos for a complete analysis. So let's get into it. Here are some of the most ridiculous things Protestants believe about Catholics. That's right, we're not saving the best for last here. We're starting with the granddaddy of them all, the accusation above all accusations. Protestants believe Catholics worship Mary and the other saints. Why? Because we pray to them, and Protestants equate prayer with worship. But the original meaning of the word prayer is to make a request, not worship. For instance, in 1 Kings, Adoniah asks Bathsheba to bring a request to her son, King Solomon. The King James Version, which was written in the 17th century, reflects how the word was used at the time. 1 Kings 2.17 And he said, Speak, I pray thee, unto Solomon the king, for he will not say thee nay, that he gave me Abishag the Shamanite to wife. Was Adoniah worshiping Bathsheba? No. When Catholics pray to Mary and the other saints, we are asking them to pray for us, just like all Christians ask other Christians to pray for them. Another reason they say we worship Mary and the saints is because we have statues of them, yet many Protestants put up statues of the Nativity during Christmas. They say Catholics violate the Second Commandment because we often kneel and pray in front of the statues, yet Christians are released from the rigidity of the law. The Second Council of Nicaea in 787 AD definitively decreed concerning statues, images of Jesus, Our Lady, angels, and the saints. Therefore, it is proper to accord to them a fervent and reverent veneration, not, however, the venerable adoration which, according to our faith, belongs to the divine being alone. So as long as we simply use images as a focal point for prayer or as a reminder of the things they represent and don't worship them, we are not guilty of breaking the spirit of the law, which is all that Christians are bound to. Here's an example. The law says to keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, the Sabbath is Saturday, not Sunday. Yet virtually all Christians, with a few exceptions, observe this commandment on Sunday, which fulfills the spirit of the law, but not the letter of the law that we've been released from. Protestants also object to prayer to the saints because the Bible forbids conjuring the dead. Yet Jesus said the saints are alive. Matthew 22, 31 and 32. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus, who was not only fully divine, but fully human as well, conversed with a dead person, Moses, during his transfiguration, which is shown to us in Matthew 17, 1 through 8, Mark 9, 2 through 8, Luke 8, 28 through 36. Jesus fulfilled the law, which means, among other things, he never broke any of the Mosaic laws, including the prohibition against conjuring the dead. So his divinity does not give him a pass. But clearly, talking to a saint is not violating that law. This claim stems from two titles used by the Pope. The first is Pontifex Maximus which was the title for the high priest of the ancient Roman religion. Yet this title did not become associated with the Pope until the 15th century and only in reaction to the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire and was never an official title for the Pope. And of course, Vicar of Christ. Vicar of Christ does not mean Christ on earth. It means Christ's representative on earth. It's pretty simple. Christ ascended into heaven and left Peter and his successors in charge, giving them authority in the Holy Ghost ensuring they will not officially teach error. It's a fulfillment of a prophecy found in Isaiah, Isaiah 22, 22 and 23. In that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judea. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. This was fulfilled 
in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, when Jesus said to Peter, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is where papal infallibility comes from, which brings me to the next crazy thing Protestants believe about Catholics. Papal infallibility does not mean everything the Pope says is true. First of all, it pertains only to faith and morals. So the Pope's opinions on politics, the environment, economics, building bridges, etc. are irrelevant. But even when it comes to faith and morals, the Pope must make an official proclamation as the universal shepherd, declaring and defining an article of faith or morals, binding all Christians to believe it in order for it to be considered infallible, which is rare and has only happened doctrinally a handful of times. Most popes never make a doctrinally infallible statement. But when they do, it has the guarantee of protection from the Holy Spirit from error. Everything else the Pope says does not have such a protection. Catholics have no interest in keeping Christ on the cross. We absolutely believe in his resurrection, as is stated in the Nicene Creed, recited most Sundays in every Catholic church. Catholics have crucifixes because Christ was crucified and his crucifixion has given us eternal life. It is a reminder of God's love and the sacrifice he made for us. And this was apparently an early tradition in the church in some form. Galatians 3.1 O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Were all the Galatians present at the crucifixion? Obviously not. Yet the scripture verse shows some kind of public display of Christ crucified, like a crucifix, perhaps. Christ said the bread and wine are his body and blood at the Last Supper. And if there's any confusion about this, read John chapter 6, where Jesus makes it clear over and over again saying, among other things, John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Here, Jesus makes it clear that the bread and wine are the sacrifice of his flesh and blood on the cross. It's not a new sacrifice of Jesus that happens at the Mass, rather the same sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which happened in time 2,000 years ago, is made present in the form of bread and wine. This claim is a little disingenuous since a similar claim can be made against Protestants who believe all they have to do is ask God to forgive them, and he will. You can sin all you want and ask God to forgive you. Or those Protestants who believe all sins, even future sins, were forgiven once they were, quote, saved. They can sin all they want and don't even have to ask for forgiveness because those sins are already forgiven. The idea that Protestants are trying to make here is that there's no reason to strive to live a holy life and not sin because confession is always available. Well, first of all, admitting your sins out loud to another person is difficult. But more importantly, in order for a confession to be valid, i.e. the sins to be forgiven, the person must have a firm purpose of amendment. In other words, they must fully intend not to sin again. So the accusation shows a fundamental ignorance of the theology behind the sacrament of confession. It would make no sense for a person to say, I'm going to sin, confess that sin to the priest, and then commit that sin again. The person would not receive God's forgiveness through confession, since the intention not to commit the sin again is not there. In fact, the sin of sacrilege has just been committed, and the person's condition is worse. Indulgences do not save people. They only count if a person ends up being saved. If a person commits mortal sin and dies in that state, they will go to hell. All the indulgences in the world won't stop that. When we die, we go to our judgment. Our judgment will either be heaven or hell. If it's hell, we go straight to hell. If it's heaven, then our works will be measured up, as described by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 12-15. If our works surpass the debt we still owe due to sin, we go to heaven. If not, we go to purgatory. And as Jesus said in Matthew 5, 26, 
we will not be let out until we have paid the last penny. People can pray for us and earn indulgences to pay off our debt so we can be released from purgatory and allowed into heaven, as shown by Jesus with the parable of the unjust steward in Luke 16, 1 through 9. Or we can earn indulgences in this life so we can avoid purgatory. At any rate, purgatory is not a halfway place where our fate is yet to be decided or a second chance. It's for the saved only. Everyone in purgatory will eventually be allowed into heaven. The reality is Catholics are encouraged to read the Bible. There's even an indulgence for reading the Bible for 30 minutes. Every Mass has readings from the Bible, a reading from the Old or New Testament, and a Gospel reading. Over a three-year period, at least 70% of the Bible is read out loud during Mass. In fact, the whole reason the Church formulated the Bible in the first place was to determine what books were suitable to be read during Mass. Protestants point out that during the Middle Ages, the Bible was not available to the Masses. But given what I just said, that's really not true. It is true that Bibles were rare and only the clergy and wealthy people had them, but that's because the printing press had not been invented yet, and it took months for a room full of monks to painstakingly handwrite one Bible. Not to mention 90% of the population was illiterate, so they wouldn't be able to read it anyway. Unfortunately, when it is revealed that their beliefs about Catholics are erroneous, some Protestants refuse to accept the truth and hold on to their misconceptions. This is called cognitive dissonance. When our worldview is shown to be wrong, even in the face of irrefutable proof, our subconscious refuses to accept it, coming up with some plausible reason why the evidence is wrong and their erroneous belief is actually the truth. This results in conspiracy theories that say, for instance, the Catholic Church is lying to its followers about what the Catholic Church really believes. After all, their pastor or some book or a televangelist said all these things are true and he's got the anointing. Or they'll assume that you are wrong about what the Catholic Church believes, even though you are a practicing Catholic and have been your whole life, and their pastor, those books, or the televangelist are correct. Well, sorry, but pastor, the book, and the televangelist are wrong. Sometimes the more reasonable person will accept these misconceptions are indeed wrong, but then assume Catholics believe these things even though they aren't true. They'll say something like, yes, but how many Catholics know this? Why would you assume that Catholics don't know the Catholic faith and believe these falsehoods put forth by Protestants? This makes no sense. Now, I'll be the first to point out that the Catholic Church has not been teaching the Catholic faith since Vatican II. Prior to that, Catholics did know the faith. But the lack of catechesis does not result in Catholics believing these ridiculous stereotypes. They are at least taught that those are false. Rather, it results in a lack of faith in the real presence, the reality of sin, and the very real possibility of damnation. They see no need to go to confession or even mass for that matter, and the Blessed Virgin Mary is hardly talked about. So they become more Protestant. Until my next video, God bless.